So digital social care records, you might hear us say DSCR today um, as abbreviation. What are they? Uh, so digital social care records often referred to um, by a lot of people in the sector as, as digital care plans, digital support plans. They are essentially a digitisation of all of the documentation that you might typically include in a, in a care plan record folder, um, digitised so that we can reap all the benefits of digitisation. So what are some of the benefits for care providers for going digital? So along with the ease of actually documenting the information at the time of providing care, the um, transparency of information, the carrying information to other people across the sector and the awareness of the care that's being provided. Um, there's also huge time saving benefits in terms of the people providing care themselves so that they're able to document the information that they need to document and then get back to the reason why they're in care in the first place and that's to provide outstanding care to the people that they're there to support. I think for me as well is I'm a regional business manager and it's having the ability to check in on a service remotely so anyway oh, I could do it from here today just to make sure you know the audits are being done any actions are followed through. Anybody else have any thoughts about digital social care records and the benefits? There's also a mass, massive safety benefit as well, so being able to really record information about people's care needs in real time and being able to highlight potential risks, things like risk of dehydration and malnutrition being able, and med medication errors and things of that nature, being able to pick up on those things and respond to them quickly and efficiently. So there's a big benefit to um, uh, service user safety as well in using digital care records. I think that's a really important point, but the other thing about them is that they're also creating a platform for the future. Mm. So as we see technology continuing to develop and evolve and see the impact that it can have in care delivery, we will need to plug a lot of the information that we're getting from some new technology into something so that we can actually make good use of the information that we're getting. So if we take as a really practical example, I think remote monitoring technologies people talk about quite a lot. What we don't really want is a situation where you have remote monitoring technology that's picking up information. It's then sending that to a central point that is then not actually coming through to you as a care provider. What you want it to do is just be presented as part of the information that's gathered for your care planning, as part of your care delivery, and then that's helping you to much more accurately look at things like the risk, as, as you said, and, and to start mapping rising levels of risk in the home as well, so that you can start to intervene slightly earlier and help to reduce people's care needs. I think it's probably also important to layer on top of this the, the, the view from the regulators. So we're, we're very interested in uh, assessing safety, we're very interested in say, assessing quality of care um, uh, and from our perspective we're looking at ensuring that providers are focused on providing compassionate, safe, effective, high quality person-centred care and, and good quality records underpin the ability for providers to be able to do that. Um, and that's true for paper records, but it is so much more true for digital records because some of the reasons that we've talked about already are uh, you know that the, 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 the power of digital solutions is so much more, you know, not just remote, the ability to look at it remotely, but the ability to, to aggregate data and use that in different ways the ability not just to improve the experience for, uh, for colleagues within uh, care services, but also that ability for uh, you to look, look at this from a management perspective and, uh, and, and oversee uh, and assess um, the, the, the quality of care and safety in an organisation. Thank you very much. And from a CQC perspective, obviously you spoke about person-centred care. A lot of the digital systems now have the automated function, so it pre-populates statements. What would your advice be for providers that are using a system where it's pre-populated and so new and could be seen as taking away some of that person-centeredness because it's obviously more of a generic response? I mean, I think for us as the regulator, and we've put this in our recent um, updated guidance on um, good practice with digital care records, is that we would still fundamentally expect that providers have person-centered care records. So there, although there may be some aspects of, for example, um, you know, act, 
activities that have been done or medications have been given that could be done as a more efficient you know, exercise in being able to record that, we would still expect for digital care records to follow the same principles that they would as paper care plans, that they should be person-centered, they should be include information about what's important to that person. Um, ideally, it should be involving that person and those that are important to them in being able to gather that information. But there are certainly efficiencies at digital care records in the daily you know, um, upkeep of people's needs and tracking of, of their needs um, that, that can add to it. So I think you can have both. You can have those efficiencies as well as having that person-centered care um, in, included in that. And I think it's also really important that we don't look at the digital care records and say, okay, that, that can pre-populate some of the data and therefore that's going to stop person-centred care. I think person-centred care is much more about the way in which the care provider operates than the technology they're using. And one of the things that we're always very mindful of in the work that we're doing is it's not about technology for technology's sake. It's about how is this helping people to deliver better care, better quality care, safer care, more efficient care. No, good point. So taking it right back, for a provider that might not have gone digital yet, what support is available at the moment from digitising social care? Lots. Um, so, Peter, do you want to explain? So at the moment we've got a combination of, um, as Chantelle said, lots of different um, pieces of support. The first thing that we've got is um, each integrated care system in the country, and I'll perhaps explain what those are in a, in a second for care providers that might not be familiar with them. Um, has staff embedded with them that we we are funding to work specifically with care providers at a local level to help them through the um, the process of identifying which care records they need, how they go about purchasing and adopting them. So that's part of it. Second part is that each of those integrated care systems also has some funding to distribute directly to care providers to help offset the initial costs of um, digitisation because we recognise that in the first year in particular you have additional costs as you start to um, shift over to the, the new record. There might be a period where you have to do some double running to make sure that you're continuing to deliver a safe service. Um, and there may be some issues around actually getting necessary hardware that you need. So again, that, the funding can help to offset um, some of those costs. I'm not going to say it's offsetting all of them, just to be very clear. Um, and then the third thing that we've got is um, we've got a list of uh, supply solutions that we've tested and assured. And what we've done with that is we, um, about 18 months ago now, when we first started the programme, um, we talked to care providers about what is it that they needed the care planning systems to do. We identified the functionality they required. We then test all of the supply solutions against that functionality. And then importantly, we also signed them up to um, comply with standards around things like data, cyber security, um, making sure that the intro that I'll try and avoid the word interoperability because it's a horrible word, but making sure that data can be shared from the NHS into social care and back from social care into the NHS. And we might well come back to that in perhaps later in the, in the um, conversation. Um, I can perhaps explain what an integrated care system is if you would like, but that may also be going into a bit more detail than people are interested in. I think while we're there, yeah, let's let's talk about them. Okay, so integrated care systems are essentially the, a new way in which the NHS is um, trying to work, and it's bringing together um, NHS services from across primary and secondary care with um, local authority and social care services as well, so that instead of looking at things through a hospital setting and trying to plan care through that individual setting, we're actually looking instead at an individual and how we think about that individual's care across the system. So the idea is that you bring everything together and think about the individual um, across their care pathway rather than through the individual's parts of the system in which we're, we're treating them. Thank you very much. So I know the challenges I found um, as a regional manager trying to access an integrated care system and it wasn't easy. It was a lot of emails, a lot of telephone calls and almost knocking down doors. And I, my worry as a registered manager, when I put my registered manager hat on, is they're time poor and having to continuously email. Would there be any advice from any of you of how to get onto the integrated care systems in the local authorities? Um, so the, uh, the, the re part of the reason we funded the posts in each integrated care system is to help with mitigate that because we do appreciate that you don't want to spend all of your time chasing people. Um, there is also a list of all of the integrated care system contacts on the digital social care website um, and that's the, the best way to get in contact with them. Um, alternatively if you're really struggling then you can contact the uh, our national team um, 
but it's worth saying that we probably have even less resources than the local integrated care system, so I can't guarantee a quick response time from us. I'd love to, but I can't. Thank you very much. So, we touched on obviously collecting data for future. What are some of the other benefits for the sector as a whole of digital social care records? Um, so, yeah, I mean, we touched, as you say, on, on the data front, and actually it's that, that data is a big benefit. We shouldn't shouldn't just move on from it too rapidly because that gives you an opportunity to think about how you plan your services, how you think about actually where is it in five years time that I need my business to be and how uh, how do I need to operate, um, where am I going to need to look at skills training for my workforce for example because I know that actually there's likely to be this shift in demand um, but some of the other benefits are around joining up the health and, and social care systems so um, the, uh, there, there's something called GP Connect, which is um, switched on in several of the uh, digital social care record systems. The GP Connect can provide a restricted view to somebody's um, primary care record, and that's uh, for um, authorised users and viewers within the care provider. And what that means is that you are, for example, as a care worker, not going to have to keep phoning up the GP to try and find out what treatments the um, somebody in your care has, has received um, and it means that you'll be able to for example pull out changes to medication and information around that so really fundamentally useful information for you when you're providing care and saves quite a significant amount of time. It's really beneficial to people who are on the receiving end of care as well because if there's that good communication between all of the providers of their social care, health care, primary care, even if you unfortunately have to go to the hospital and discharging back again, there's nothing more annoying than having to go to one provider to the next and having to explain yourself all the way from the start again. So having that kind of continuous record of a person's pathway through health and social care can be really beneficial and saves a lot of time. Um, in the way that we can communicate about people's needs and make sure that they're met and joined up. And if I can give a really practical example mm. of that. Um, so back in February, my grandmother was uh, in a care home. Um, I was with her uh, and um, essentially she had uh, low oxygen levels and an ambulance was called out and the care home had a, a digital social care record system in place. Um, unfortunately, the ambulance uh, wasn't digitised, so we had to have a printed copy of the uh, digital social care record, which I then took into A and E, um, and we were then able to share with A and E the medication history from my grandmother. The um, A and E department would not have had that information otherwise. They didn't know to look for it, and they wouldn't have known to look for it if I hadn't been there to to highlight it for them. If we're able to join these systems together then that information will just be available to them and they will just see it as part of their day-to-day -day view of information in the hospital. And I think there's a, if we think about the, the long term, there's a wider societal benefit of us bringing data, high quality data together in a safe and secure way that enables us to look at the experience that people have across that whole system of care. Um, and it enables us will enable us in the future to uh, adopt approaches like population health management which looks at how do we apply the scarce resources that we have as a country to the best effect to support people so you know we might in the future be able to make some very sensible pragmatic decisions about where to focus our investment for it you know, given the interrelated nature of, of, of health and social care so for example I mean some of the analysis that um, uh, the, the college and NHSE have done have highlighted areas where uh, a focused targeted investment in social care could have uh, released pressure within urgent emergency care for example if we don't have the data that uh, enables us to look at a population and a, and a place level uh, we're not going to be able to, 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 to understand those interdependencies and interconnections so there's, a, there's an exciting future for us in terms of joining up data. Um, there's lots of obviously concerns about uh, 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 you know, the potential for uh, privacy uh, but the, the benefits for us if we do this in a safe and secure way could potentially be really significant. Yeah, no, I definitely agree and I think echoing what you said actually for that person, somebody who's worked in social care for my whole career, we've always said actually you have to tell that person's story so many times or that person has to tell it for themselves and actually just being able to do that once or maybe twice yeah is so much time saved 
so much pressure will be relieved from both the provider and the person receiving support. And I know firsthand, you know, you've been in hospital and you tell, you check in at A&E and you tell something, and then you tell the consultant something, and then you're admitted onto the ward, you've got to tell them. And then you've got to go back and tell, the, you know, your staff and your team the same thing. So I definitely see the pros of joined up systems. As the regulator, we expect providers to operate systems of good governance where you have good quality assurance systems and risk management systems. And having the digital social care records is a massive piece to that, to being able to, in real time, there's nothing, as you probably had experience with, you know, auditing, you know, records, you know, a, a month later or whatever, it's already happened, you know, it's too late by that point. So being able to more proactively and continuously having those quality monitoring, particularly if you're a, a larger provider, maybe you've got, you know, 20 or more care homes, that's a lot of, you know, auditing and quality assurance activity. The digitization of, of social care records can make that a lot simpler and more straightforward and more in real time as well so that you can pick up on those things at an earlier stage rather than waiting for something to happen. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think in terms of sharing the information it's so much quicker just to be able to download it onto the system attach it into an email make sure it's secure and send it as opposed to what you were talking about of pulling out the archive and having to either scan it and then go to the post and post it and hope that it doesn't get lost in the post and bits and pieces so looking into the future of digital social care records obviously we can't be there right now what does the future look like do we think <coughs> obviously we've seen some systems come out that are using AI that are, you know, predicting where adults may be falling on a regular basis so that you can make sure that you put extra resource into that time at the right place. Have you seen anything that you think might revolutionise digital social care records going to the future? I think in the I think there's lots of opportunity, right? And and I think as a regulator, we want to be innovative and, and enabling and supporting. Uh, providers to make good, safe, careful decisions about the adoption of new technology, whether that be AI or whether that be um, some more basic technology that actually has a real demonstrable impact on people's, people's outcomes and their quality of life. Um, there's lots of very um, simple monitoring um, applications of technology that have a huge impact on people. I would say too, I mean, I think the future, I think this, I think digitization of social care is really one of the key pieces, not the only piece, but a really key piece to that um, uh, parity of esteem, I think, between social care and health. Um, I think health service, um, you know, primary care and hospitals have had lots of technology and innovation and digital records for quite some time now, and I think social care hasn't as much. Um, I think ha having them on the, an even playing field in terms of digitization, I think will do a lot to kind of bringing those two together in a really meaningful way. Um, it's something that we've been, work we've all who've worked in the sector for a long time have been talking about for many years, many decades around that parity of esteem and that real true integration that happens for the benefit of people and communities. I think it's a great point. I think it could be a really great leveler. Mm, absolutely. And, and where, 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 f where funding is tight, the application of, of really great technology solutions can, can really raise the, raise the bar in terms of quality. And I wonder with, I wonder with the, the speed that digital is happening around us, you almost go to sleep and you wake up the next day and something you know, is advanced. Do we think that actually social care might advance the NHS? Because obviously, I spoke about obviously there's now systems on the market that are using AI. Are the NHS using AI or anything kind of around that? Do you know? So the NHS are using AI, but you have just hit on something that I want us to be doing in social care, which is getting ahead of the NHS on some of this stuff. Yeah. I think there are huge opportunities that don't exist in the NHS space, partly because of all of the existing infrastructure that's in place. We have an opportunity actually to just jump a generation of technology in the social care space. Um, I think we also have an opportunity to learn some of the lessons from the way in which the NHS architecture in particular has, has um, ended up being built. So. Sorry, what, what I mean by the NHS architecture is things like how the data sets actually connect together and then how you make use of those data sets. And I think if I could return to your previous question about the future of digital social care records, I think my view of them is that they are a platform that you consume information through. Um, so whether you're then having AI within the digital social care record itself locally, or whether you're plugging in a third party um, piece of software that might be doing um, decision support and re recommending different care pathways and different care packages or whether you might be plugging in the um, care technology. That doesn't necessarily all need to be within the digital social care record itself. 
but it all needs to be presented through that so that it's much slicker as an interface. So again, learning the lessons from the NHS where we've often got fragmented systems that you have to log into separately, frequently separate logins each time. We don't really want a situation where people are having to remember dozens of passwords and frankly they don't <laughs> check dozens of different systems. We know there's a big problem with alert fatigue, so um, decision support tools are great if you then do something with the alerts that you've received, but if you receive 100 alerts then you just ignore them because you don't have the time to do anything with them. Um, so I think, that's, I think that's where I would see digital social care records developing to. Um, and as I say, I think there's an opportunity for us to leapfrog the NHS in, in lots of areas. I think it was really telling at the Health and um, Care Show earlier this year, most of the really exciting innovation was in the social care area. I'm really pleased you touched on alerts there because it was a question that I had in the back of my mind around, we're capturing a lot of data, there probably are providers that are capturing too much data. From a regulator's point of view, you spoke obviously about alerts being unmanaged. Where does the regulator stand on if you've got too much data or if you've got alerts coming in that aren't being actioned? So for example, you might be supporting somebody with a learning disability around, you know, the system might have hydration alerts. That person doesn't have any need for hydration, but the provider hasn't turned them off or isn't monitoring them. Then the inspector walks through the door and sees, oh, actually, you've got 50 here alerts from a regulator's point of view? I think we will be focused on, I keep saying it, we will focus on safety and we focus on the, the quality outcomes um, for people. We're not, we're, not, we're not validating systems and we won't, you know, we won't say one system is better than another. In fact, you know, with, with systems, it, it, you know, it's often the implementation of those systems, the careful implementation of those systems that's the most, the most important and powerful thing. Um, so how providers use systems will be important. You know, if you've made some good pragmatic decisions about, you know, this level of alerting doesn't make any sense for these people and therefore switch it off. I mean, that's, you know, that's going to that's going to be part of a well managed system. So I think as long as you are, you know, well managed managing systems well to ensure uh, uh, those good quality outcomes and that people are safe, then um, the, the regulator will be, you know, your inspector will be will, will be will be will be happy with that. Um, I mean, th there is an interesting concept about data in the wider context with the CQC, which is, um, you know, we we are moving to our new single assessment framework this year. Um, uh, that, that we will, you know, be innovating and supporting providers with better and easier ways to submit data to us. Um, there will be the ability in the future for actually these systems to send data. Um, through mechanisms directly to us, so you know another huge benefit potentially of um, of some digital social care record systems is actually reducing the burden of administration and sending data to the regulator and potentially to other to, to other areas as well. I think as well in terms of the going back to the question of you know what the future of them looks like and, and feeding from Mark's comments around implementation. Um, as part of our digitising social care programme, we also launched the digital skills framework earlier this year, we, uh, an updated version of it. And that, I think, is one of those, a really good tangible example of something that could be used to support people on their journey to digitisation. You know, you can take yourself through that framework and understand what your current um, competency levels are, where you might want to look to um, improve your awareness of digitisation. I think that is a really tangible step that care providers, when going back to your original question of, you know, where do I start, where do I begin? Understanding those fundamentals can really help you and point you in the right direction of, of what's the next step on this journey. Because if you are completely paper-based, um, you know, your first initial step might not be right now to implement a digital social care records there might be something else that you can do first in terms of creating that culture shift, taking your, your colleagues and your staff on that journey of digitisation, creating those foundations for understanding those benefits and the skills framework will help with some of that. And then it's about, as you say, feeding in the digital social care record at the right time and what that implementation looks like. Now that's a really good point. And I think there's also the guidance from Department of Health and Social Care around what good looks like in terms of digital, which, you know, I was reading the other day and it breaks it down really easily and simply of what they expect from the local authority and what care providers should be doing and looking for. And you touched there on, and I know we've spoken about, you know, 
the very early days of adopting technology, what kind of things should a provider be looking for when they're looking for a digital system? So I quite often, you know, on the manager groups, the manager forums, the WhatsApp groups I'm in, there's always people saying, I'm thinking of going digital. Is there anybody anybody recommends? And my worry is that all the systems have pros and cons. And it's about whether it's right for your service. And I know one of the biggest downloads that I have from my own newsletters is around that digital journey and breaking it down onto actually, you need to find a system that is right for you, right for your staff team so that they want to use it and are on board with it. And also that's right for the people that you're supporting. Have you got any tips for what providers can use in the early days of adoption? I think it's, as, as you've mentioned, I think it's about understanding what your specific needs are because, you know, if you're a couple hundred care provider operating in, you know, across the UK and you're providing, you know, a real mix of, um, you know, older people's care services and learning disabilities, your needs are going to be very, very different to an independent care provider, you know, who has one care home supporting working age adults with, living with learning disabilities. You know, they're, they're very different needs. And I think it's understanding what your specific business needs, what's important to the people that you provide support to, what's important to your staff, what's important to you as an organisation, and what are, the, what are the challenges that you're currently facing? What is your digital, uh, your paper-based, sorry, system not giving you? What, what are the risks that you're facing? What are the biggest challenges that you've got as an organisation? And feeding those into some of the requirements and understanding, meeting as many of the suppliers as you can, getting out to the care shows and the conferences and meeting them and having that list at the top of your mind all the time how does this how does this help me reduce risk how does this not only make me more compliant but actually how does it help me provide better quality care and those are the questions that you should be asking and unfortunately there isn't a very clear answer to that because it will vary depending on each each care provider and if if i could add one other thing to that which is i think thinking about how much you want to change the way that you operate to match the system or how much you want to change the system to match the way that you operate. So there are some products that would work absolutely fine off the shelf but you need to change the way in which you operate in order to use them. There are other products that are highly configurable but you then need to have the digital skills in your organisation and the appetite to do that absolutely. configuration. And I think one thing that I always refer providers that are looking for a system or even if they've got a system that isn't working for them and they're looking for a new one is obviously the Assure Provider List. Is anybody able to talk about that in more detail of kind of how, how those suppliers get onto that Assure Provider list, the checks that are made? First of all, it's worth saying that um, we branded it wrong originally. So we talked about Assured Suppliers. The reality is that it's Assured Solutions. So it's a, um, an individual supplier may actually end up with more than one Assured Solution if they have more than one product. So uh, I think it's an important point to make. Um, so the Assured Solution list um, essentially has two stages to the assurance process. The first is um, what's called a, a dynamic purchasing system, which is not really of much relevance to most care providers unless they're public sector organisations. So if they're public sector, then it's essentially a way in which they can purchase in a compliant way. If they're not, then they can largely ignore the fact that it's a dynamic purchasing system. But what we do with the, um, that initial assessment for that dynamic purchasing system is that we receive um, video submissions from each of the suppliers against the different functional requirements that we've um, set out. And as I said earlier, those were um, originally developed with care providers to make sure that it was capturing the, the key functionality that they wanted to see from a, a care record system. Um, we evaluate each of those videos to make sure that they do actually demonstrate the functionality that's described. Um, and we also check references to make sure that the functionality that's there is actually available to um, care providers. So one of the things that you sometimes find in these sorts of processes with unscrupulous suppliers, and we don't have any of those obviously because we wouldn't, they wouldn't have made it through assurance, um, but you sometimes find that people essentially provide what looks like a, a slideshow that has a click through that looks like it's an interactive video but in reality isn't. Um, or they have show you something that's available in a, a test build of their system but isn't actually available to care providers. So that reference check with care providers is absolutely critical to make sure that we are actually seeing real live functionality. So that's the first stage. That's what's required to get them on the initial assured list. Suppliers at that point sign um, contracts with us, um, which includes contracts around um, ongoing supplier assurance. And then we have a um, what's called a catalogue services agreement, 
which essentially sets out a set of different standards that they have to be compliant with in future. Um, and we have then an assurance process that sits behind that where, again, we similarly test the individual parts of their system, test their responses to make sure that they are compliant. And that, that second stage covers um, things like business continuity and disaster recovery in more detail. It covers the um, interoperability standards, so things like the, the GP Connect standard that I've already talked about. Um, and it will also cover then connection to some of the shared care record systems in future, which give you access to even more data and, and more information. Um, and it covers um, some of the key cyber requirements, for example. Um, one of the critical things that it does that is different to the initial assessment is it also gives us a mechanism for um, essentially regulating the commercial behaviours of some of the suppliers as well. So there's some information, in, or there's some things we test in there about contract exit. So that if you decide at the end of your existing contract with the supplier that you want to move to another one, you should be able to get the data out of their system and put it into a new system in a relatively straightforward way. Now, obviously, that's very dependent on the data standards and making sure the data is the same across the board. And that's why we've been doing some work to define a minimum operational data set. That's um, in draft form at the moment. Um, I think we're expecting to publish an updated version in September, and then that will be something that's built into the future assurance for suppliers. So that's something that will be a benefit in the future, but isn't quite there yet. No, thank you very much. And I think it's also worth reminding providers, you've got the Assure provider list, but there are a number of suppliers that are going through that process. They won't be on your website as of yet, but it's still worth contacting them and I'm going through a change at the moment within my own organisation of we're using one system and we're looking at what else is out there because things have changed and you know we have different needs for the business. And actually, I know I've spoken to a few providers or suppliers and have said, do you have plans to go on this your provider list? Whereabouts are you on that journey? And can you give me a kind of an X date of when you will be on it? Because it's one of the things that we obviously want to go by is the Assure provider list. So the one thing I'd be cautious about there is if a supplier tells you they've got a date when they will be assured by it because... Um, it is surprising how many suppliers need to bid more than once because we often find that they have perhaps misinterpreted the question or don't have the functionality that we have described. Um, so one of the big areas when we first launched the list 18 months ago now, maybe a year ago, um, maybe two years ago, that's, that's quite worrying. <laughs> um, but when we first launched the list, a number of the um, suppliers who bid the first time around didn't have the reporting functionality that we defined and actually they failed and they had to rebid once they developed that reporting functionality and that reporting functionality is really really important because that's the basis for reducing the burden when you're reporting into regulators, reducing the burden when you're sending information into local authorities. We're having conversations with some of the national team around um, how do we capture data that the department is after and how do we make sure that we can standardise that more and again hopefully reduce the, the data burden for um, for care providers. I think the key things as well from the from a care provider perspective um, is that is that assured supplier um, when you're speaking to a assured supplier is it that solution are you talking about the same solution because as Peter mentioned some of the um, suppliers have multiple solutions so it's just about being really specific is it is it this solution that is on the assured supplier list I think it's also about understanding, as Peter said, that people you know, reference working towards being an assured supplier, but yeah, absolutely, if they, if they give a, a date when they will be an assured supplier, then from my perspective, it would be a bit of a red flag because actually it's an assessment and we don't, you don't know whether you're gonna, whether you're gonna meet that, that assessment or not. Um, but I think also building on that, there's also the um, digital social care funding, the digitizing social care funding, um, is only available for assured solutions. So if you're looking to um, access funding through your ICS, then actually you, you should be looking towards that list um, for your solution because we know for all of the reasons that Peter has articulated, we have confidence in those solutions as they, as they stand. Um, so that's where, that's where the funding would be available. Well, it's worth also saying, if you're talking to um, suppliers that aren't on that list, list is open for application at any time. We would strongly encourage suppliers to apply. You know, thank you very much. So, burning question from providers, from somebody from the CQC to answer, is will 
digital social care records become mandatory during inspections? So it isn't for us to mandate um, any particular requirements, but what I would say is, um, I mentioned about our single assessment framework, um, that's something that all providers will, uh, will, will start to learn about over the course of the next uh, few, few months. Um, part of that is a, a, a body of consistent quality statements that, um, uh, that will uh, apply to various different parts of the operation. Um, part of that will look at um, your ability to manage good, good quality care records. And uh, what we would certainly see over time is that it would, it's likely to become increasingly difficult to maintain the levels of quality that other providers are achieving with digital, quality, uh, with digital, uh, with, with digital social care records and therefore it becoming increasingly difficult to maintain a good or outstanding rating if you have not made that move. Um, you know, we talked about the support, that's, you know, the significant support available right now. I mean, our, our, our advice to providers is to take advantage of that support while it's available, while there's a momentum of people adopting digital social care records, while there's support, while there's funding available, while there are peer networks that are developed around this. Um, now is the time to do it and to take advantage of that and and you'll see you'll see the benefits not just of using the systems but the ability to be able to maintain and improve your standards of of quality of care in the future and I think one of the reasons why I think it will become increasingly difficult for providers who aren't on digital systems to demonstrate high, as high quality as other as um, others who are is around that the issue around that communication and the pathways with with health and social care I think one of the things that we'll be assessing amongst other things is around the extent to which providers and local authorities and integrated care systems are communicating are working together are collaborating um, around people and communities and what they need and a dig digitization is a really big piece to that to be able to demonstrate how you're doing that how you're communicating how you're sharing information to the benefit of that person and what it is that they need so that is going to be a key issue one thing I did prior to today's recording was reached out to a number of providers and we did hear from some providers that said they really want to go digital, they want to implement electronic care planning records, medication records, but they had adults that they were supporting that had capacity and didn't want to be on a digital system. We also heard from some that had staff that didn't want to have their records on a digital system. What advice would you have for providers that are facing those kind of challenges, either from someone they're supporting or from the staff? A really good question. I mean, I think it's around. I think around any change. I think it's really around exploring what are the reasons behind that and trying to understand what are the barriers to that. I think I would get, guess that the the reticence to be wanting to have your records, whether as an employee or or as a, a person um, who's using services, to have a digital care record about you is around safety and security. So probably as from a provider perspective, it's about having that conversation with that individual or the staff member around what is it, what are your concerns, and being able to reassure them about the security of the systems, the benefits, et cetera, and being able to communicate that with them um, and understanding you know, what value that it would add to them and how they can keep their information secure in the same way that they would with a paper record. Um, you know, they have to consider things around security, safe, you know, safekeeping and information sharing. You touched there on security and it's something that we've kind of alluded to, touched on around cyber security. What steps should providers be taking to make sure that the data is safe, to make sure that, you know, they've got things in place? What would be your top tips for a provider? So I, th I think my initial advice would be for people to reach out to um, local support organisations who are um, providing direct hands-on assistance around um, data services protection toolkit compliance. Um, they are funded through a, a sister program of ours, um, which is, is looking at how we improve cybersecurity in the sector and is very much uh, taking a, a sector-led approach to doing that. So it's largely delivered by um, people like the, uh, the National Care Forum and the Care Provider Alliance. There's a, a group of those national care bodies who have come together to, to act as delivery partners for that. Um, so that's, that's the immediate term I think we obviously are also then testing cybersecurity in the digital social care record so we've made um, cyber essentials plus a core requirement it's something that if you don't have it you don't get onto the list um, it's an absolute minimum uh, requirement from our perspective so you can have a degree of uh, confidence in the security of those systems 
And, and from our from our perspective, we, you know, we would absolutely encourage and endorse all providers to adopt the uh, the, the, the standards of the DSPT. Um, and of course, by by taking a system off the assured su supplier list, the assured solution list, um, you, you part of the accreditation will involve ensuring that systems are safe and secure. The other thing for providers to be to be very careful of is, of course, the weak link. It, typically isn't systems, it's humans. Um, and we need to make sure that, that colleagues have the appropriate training for both you know, personal and professional use in you know, safe, secure um, use of systems. Um, and when you look at the, the standards of the DSPT, you know, there, there will be, uh, there'll be, there'll be lots in there that actually is a lot of standard practice and common sense about making sure that you change default passwords and that you have secure passwords about the, the, the way that you do things and you don't share passwords and that sort of thing. So it's all, it's all actually, it's, it's, it sounds quite scary, but actually when you look at the practical realities of how you implement safe systems, um, it's relatively straightforward. Just very important that you do it and it's very important that you, you make sure that all your staff are appropriately trained and understand the vulnerabilities and risks that, that, that exist. And if I could just add to that and do a bit of a call back to the point about personalised care planning as well, you really need to make sure that people are engaged in the process. If they treat it as a tick box, if it's just something where you've picked something up off the shelf and, and used that in order to get compliance, it's not going to have any benefit or any impact for you as an organisation. Um, so you, you need to make sure people properly engage in it and are approaching it appropriately. Well, if I could just add to that as well, I think it's really important that the, the care manager has sort of a driving force for this but it doesn't necessarily need to be the only one and you'll often find that there are people in your workforce who are really passionate about digital who have um, perhaps more time available and might be able to do some of that background research and, and perhaps lead the charge instead of instead of you and actually having something that's led by um, your, your team can often be more effective when you're looking at a change program like this um, because they're the ones that are going to be using it most often. So actually, if you've got a, a care worker, for example, who's really passionate about um, technology, perhaps they've used it in a previous organisation they worked for, then harness that. Absolutely, you know, make good use of that. Make them your digital champions. Digital yes. champions. One thing that I've seen um, or heard that's worked really well, particularly in a provider that may have multiple locations, so this is a big undertaking for them to have to roll out new digital systems where they weren't there before, is like having like pilot. So you may have a couple of services that you pilot it and then being able to then, you know, use that kind of momentum to say, oh, wow, look at the benefits so that actually you've got this, you know, whole team behind you um, that are working towards the implementation of that and being able to demonstrate the value. So it can be really helpful. I think the, the benefit there, and that's a really important point, is the benefit there of having somebody who's in your shoes, who mm. does what you do, who understands what your day looks like mm. and explains the, the benefits and how it's changed their working day and how they support people um, is is a really accessible way to understand the benefits because it's it's very different to a conversation from a you know a supplier or us sitting here working you know in, in the NHS or for the Department of Health and Social Care and, and and talking about the benefits actually to have that conversation with somebody with a peer who's been there and, and done it and understands and is is now living through those benefits is 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 hugely transformational. One of the interesting things, just thinking about the, the, the staff experience, is as time goes on, it is now, I, I think we've probably passed the 50% mark, it's now more likely that providers have got digital systems and really good digital systems than not. And in an age where it is incredibly difficult to recruit staff, I think people will start to find that staff have demands about you having a digital system as a provider and, and that is a, a recruitment and retention tool uh, because you know there's a, there's a large, largely younger workforce that actually have an expectation that I can use these digital systems. I don't expect to, at the end of the day, then have to have an hour where I do paperwork. Perfect, thank you very much. And some practicalities for care managers, registered managers. If there's somebody out there at the moment, they're using a the system, it might be that the pandemic came along and they put something in really quickly, they didn't do their homework because actually they saw that a lot of other registered managers were talking about the pros of being um, digitally online. 
they've now realized that that platform isn't right for their service, it either isn't right for the staff team that are using it, so they haven't got that kind of buy-in, or it's not right for the adults that they're supporting. What would your advice be if they're kind of stuck in a contract, but they know there is a system out there that could do something or meet their demands a lot better? Any advice there? I think it would depend on what is written in the contract and how long the contract is. Um, so the first thing that I would do is I would have a look at the other systems that are out there to see if there is one that is markedly more fit for purpose for them and that they are um, very keen to, to adopt. The second thing that I would think about if I was in their position is how easy is it for me to extract my data from the current system and what are the clauses around that in the existing contract. And the third thing that I would look at is what are the contract exit terms. Um, and that's the, really the critical bit because you may have a five-year contract, but actually if the, the contract has a break clause in it that says to you, um, you know, you can cancel the contract at any point subject to this payment, then that might be worth you doing if it's a system that's genuinely not fit for purpose for you. But that's going to be very much a case-by-case -case basis and each care provider will need to make their own business decision on that, unfortunately. Um, they will be able to access all of our... Um, guidance and the assured solutions list um, and I would strongly encourage them to look at using an assured solution um, but it's really important that they make that business decision themselves as, as a, an organisation. I think it's also worth as well having a conversation with, this, with the solution provider themselves because we've talked about how there's um, suppliers that have multiple solutions for example and um, there are different variations of different um, digital social care records and it might be that they are looking for development and input for some of the challenges that you're having. Whereabouts are they in terms of any um, developmental upgrades and what, what's their backlog of new features that they want to add and it might be that you're able to be, to be part of that and, and be part of that journey um, to, to helping them to, to redefine and and make their product better. So I would definitely advise a conversation with the supplier themselves, let them know the challenges that you're having, make sure that you've got a, a record of you know, the conversations that you've had around improvements that you'd like to see. Um, and yeah, because a lot of solution suppliers out there, they would bite your hand off at that first-hand experience of how their, how their system translates in your, in your setting, in your environment. That's a good question to ask because I think I found that they're all very honest actually about what they can, they can't do. Yeah. You know, when you're on those kind of introductory calls, you know, testing it, you can really home in on kind of what you really want it for, how much data, their cloud space and bits and pieces. And I found them all to be very honest and transparent in what they can and can't do. And that goes back to your point about doing the pre-work around talking to your staff, talking to the people that use the service, even talking to relatives who, because some, some of these systems have some functionalities around next of kin and legal representatives being able to have some access to platforms and things like that. And doing that pre-work of just sort of understanding what it is that they would want from the systems and, and things like that before you then decide what it is that you, know, um, that you want to purchase from a supplier. Thank you very much. And in terms of a... Uh a care leader, a care manager, where can we signpost them to today to upskill themselves on the knowledge around digital systems? The digital Social Care website. Um, so the Digital Social Care website has within it the skills framework, the digital skills framework. I would really recommend that and as we've mentioned before, the what good looks like um, as sort of tools for broadening your own understanding and the digital skills framework in particular has some really great references of places to go, tangible places that would um, um, pinpoints of information that will be able to support you um, on that journey. And we've just published some updated guidance about what good digital social care records look like and our um, expectations are from a regulator point of view for providers who may already be using the systems or who are planning to use the systems, the sorts of things that we'll be looking for in our new single assessment framework and um, as we go forward with our monitoring and assessment. Thank you very much. And I guess from a provider point of view, it's also worth looking on some of those digital social care record websites because a lot of them have newsletters and blogs that are written by registered managers or people working kind of on the front line. So actually they're really informative around, you know, it could be something on change management and how you can go through that with your team. It could be something around a guide of what, you know, what you could implement for digital. So I think it's worth looking around. And I think one thing we do really well in social care is the collaboration and is talk to your fellow peers. You know, don't always take everything as gospel because like I said earlier, there's always going to be pros and cons of every system. 
take in that information and then go away and do your own research. And I know like in, in our social care love, the trade associations have been really heavily involved in that support, that peer support, information sharing, horizon scanning. And so if you aren't a member of a, a trade association, it's something to consider because it is a massive network of support for those types of things and other sticky issues that providers deal with um, in adult social care. So other than digital social care records, is there a system or anything digital that care providers could implement that would benefit their staff teams or the people that they're supporting? Yeah, so there's a whole heap of technologies available. Um, some technologies that lots of us use at home, for example, um, you know, smart speakers as such that we all use, a lot of us use every day, um, to more specialist solutions. Um, I think it's about, as we've spoken about earlier in this conversation, it's about what technology is right for the, for the person and for the situation and for the environment. Um, so we launched earlier this year the Adult Social Care Technology Fund. That launched in April and it's open for the duration of this, this year. And it allows care providers, local authorities, um, technology suppliers themselves, ICS, ICB, to come forward and suggest technologies that they'd like to implement and the benefits that they, that they think that they could see. Um, that is um, funded to a maximum of £600,000 and we do um, stipulate that there needs to be at least 20% investment in that evidence generation and that evidence partner. And so we're looking at, you know, £600,000 projects, we're looking at quite substantial projects here with that 20% focus on evidence generation. Um, that's us building that evidence base for scale and understanding which technologies have a real benefit and where do they have benefit. We've talked earlier in this conversation about digital social care records and how they, some are more applicable in some settings than others and that for us is a big focus as well because some technologies might have a huge benefit in certain environments but not be so, so applicable in others. So I'd say that if, if anybody out there is looking for looking at adopting digital technologies beyond digital social care records, there's, there's the fund that's available, but also going out and, and speaking to other people and understanding what they're, what they're using and also going back to, as we, as we said with digital social care records, when you're starting that journey, it's asking what are my risks, what are my challenges, what's important to me? And if you understand those things, that can guide your decision making whether, you know, if your company or your organisation, your home, um, the service that you provide has specific challenges around medications and medications incidents, then looking at EMAR systems, electronic medication administration record systems, for example. If you've got lots of challenges around falls, then sensor-based technologies can help not only identify a fall, but some will also use things like artificial intelligence to understand and predict whether there's a chance of a fall, a fall in the future. So there's, there's lots of different technologies out there and I, and I, could, I could talk about it all day and, and I won't, I'll stop. I think from a provider's point of view, is also look at what's outside of social care, especially if it's something that's going to benefit your team around work-life balance or support or communication, because actually some of the things that are outside are actually really good systems that you could implement within your team and have really good results. One thing to say on that point is that outside of um, you know um, the digital systems to support the care for people, I have heard from providers who are using digital systems for like workforce management stuff. That's super super effective. So it really cuts down on I'm sure in your days as a, as a home manager, you know, having can you cover this shift? Can you cover that shift? Actually, it automates a lot of that and creates opportunities for staff to just proactively pick up shifts as they need to. Um, so there's a lot of stuff around around those kind of processes that can make that really quick and efficient and help. To, for that workforce management as well. I, I love the aspiration that you had earlier on, Peter, which was, can social care leapfrog the rest of health? And I think there is the opportunity for it to do that because there are so many applications for technology to really support in this environment. Social care is made up of so many different organisations when compared to obviously the one NHS body. It's actually what's where the benefit is because there's so many of us doing different things with different systems. Like you just said, it's bringing that around the table and sharing those ideas and picking what's the best ones for our teams and the people we support and then getting rid of the other systems that actually don't, don't quite make that cut. Before we end today, is there any final words, any bits of advice that anybody wants to share around digital social care records? about going digital for care providers. We'll start, start with you and we'll go round. <laughs> I think the only thing that I would just add is just how exciting this opportunity is for the sector. I think it can often feel like there are insurmountable challenges, um, particularly when you look at some of the things like the, the vacancy rates, the difficulties with recruitment and retention, all of those things. 
it's sometimes hard to see the level of opportunity that, that there is here to transform the way in which people receive their care um, and to really change the way in which we think about social care. I mean, I think we spend a lot of time talking about challenges in social care and health as well, and there certainly are, but I absolutely think that there, this is a huge um, opportunity, a huge area that um, providers and people and communities can get excited about around digital opportunities, innovation, technology, and social care, and what it can do for people to improve their um, experience of care, improve their pathway of care, making that smooth, and ultimately keeping people safe and at the heart of their care. I mean, w what I would say is I would echo Peter's points about this is a fabulous opportunity. What we're talking about here actually is the beautiful basics. We're talking about implementing systems that support care workers to do the fabulous job that they do. Um, what, one message I would just like to leave you, um, if, 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 if there's one thing you take away from me, which is I know there's often a perception that the CQC is the big bad regulator that is against change and against, against innovation. It couldn't be farther from the truth. We are really supportive of this program. We can see the enormous benefit and we're supportive of the off-the-wall stuff as well as the as well as the beautiful basics, provided that it's safe and that it's about improving the quality of care for, for the people that we care for. I have nothing to add from a um, additional points perspective in terms I feel like we've we've absolutely covered everything. I think the only thing that I want to say to the sector is is just thank you. Thank you for for watching and absorbing um, all of this information, but also thank you for everything that you do every day to support the people that you support. And we hope that in what we're trying to achieve here, we help in some way um, to make your job even better um, because I think it's the best job in the world. So thank you for everything that you're, that you're doing. Thank you very much, I echo that. And I just want to say thank you very much for all of you coming together to join me for this because I know obviously everybody's got busy, busy schedules, but I think like you said, actually, he's really going to support care providers and those care managers actually to make their journey into digital social care. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. much.